you know, the, the whole European thing has looked like a bit of a mess. It looks for the independent side like a bit of a kind of weak point. Because last time around, everybody in Europe was playing games with their own political domestic situations and trying to suggest that Scotland was just going to be a huge problem in Europe. Um, actually, it needn't be like that at all. And what we have tried to do with this book called Mixed Smorgasbord, it was going to be called Scotland After Brexit, but that just seemed to be more interesting, was the idea is that within the Nordic nations, you have a veritable smorgasbord of different possible relations with Europe. Small countries have got lots of different ways of being with Europe, and the way that they've chosen is generally dictated by what is in the interest of that country. I mean, it kind of goes without saying, but astonishingly in Britain, where nothing is about what's in the economic interest of the country, you have to kind of say it because it seems to be unusual. So if we had a conference in October last year, had speakers from each of these countries, and began to realise as we were listening to them, that there's a whole range of different ways Scotland can be in Europe. And to be honest with you, I couldn't even say myself now, having listened to all of them and edited all of this, which one would be best. It's that good. <laughs> Um, really, the way it works within the Nordic countries, and it, it would be great if we could have shown you a picture just to remind you of what they all are. But yeah, thank you very much. It moves from Finland, um, which is right slap bang against Russia. Well, Finland is the most keen of the Nordic countries, the most keen Europhile, and it's for one very simple reason. Really, um, they're right up slap bang against Russia. Um, Ludovic Kennedy once quoted somebody else as saying that Scotland was in bed with an elephant being in a union with England. Now, in that case, Finland is in bed with Stegosaurus. <laughs> it's also kind of taken a nasty wee turn lately. You know, it's a, it's a scary position to be in. And uh, the Finns have actually got a, in, written into their constitution. They have a constitutional block on being a member of NATO. Because even that would be seen as provocative to Russia. So for them, the only security that they've got is the European Union. It's their defense policy. It's what makes them feel Western. It's what begins to make them have an identity that isn't just constantly sitting on the edge of this gigantic other Eastern state. So for Finland, it makes quite a lot of sense to be hugely keenly European. They're also in the Euro. They really have gone the whole hog. And right on the other extreme are the North Atlantic states of Iceland and Norway, and actually in the middle of it, the Faroes, it's not a state that it would like to be, but which is just a collection of 40,000 people on 18 of the most barren goddamn islands you'll ever see in your life, right? <laughs> who nonetheless have the world's truly most powerful devolved parliament. But anyway, this group, for them, fishing is such a huge proportion of their economy that when the option of being EU members was raised, they took one look at the common fisheries policy and just went, no. Nah. And that was it. They just didn't consider it further. Um, so Iceland and Norway joined what was known as the, the European Economic Area. To get this straight, you've got to kind of imagine, back in the 1960s, 70s, there were two trading clubs on the go in Europe. One was the one which was to become the European Union. But the other one, the little underdoggy one that didn't really do as well, was after the European Free Trade Area. So they were both trying to get members. Um, EFTA has now got Norway, Iceland, uh, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland in it. Think. Um, so it's not doing that well for it. You know, as against the 28 members of the EU. But nonetheless, what they have managed to do, those of them which want to trade within Europe, have been able to do that via the European uh, Economic Area. That is the 28 people in the EU, plus the three of the four in EFTA who want to trade in Europe. That is the EEA. And if you look at it in, a, in, a, in another way, I mean, the EEA, oh, in a way, is a bit like the saucer <coughs> to the EU cup. The EEA is the fundamental things. It's the single market. It's the, the freedoms, freedom of movement and trade and so on. The cup are the policies which you might or might not be interested in. 
the cup has the policies like the common agricultural policy, not too sure about that, the common fisheries policy, disastrous, the customs union, you might not want that if you're going to be an independent country actually, in Scotland, and so a lot of problematic things are sitting in this cup. It's not probably wrong with the underlying principles, that's the EEA, it's the cup that's causing a few difficulties here. So, could, is there a possibility you could have one without the other? Well, that's precisely what the North Atlantic states of Norway and Iceland have done. Um, when they entered, particularly Norway, whose politicians were very keen, the, the Norwegians are huge internationalists, very keen on Europe, and uh, their politicians wanted to full, be, become full members of the EU, but their people didn't. Um, they had two referendums, and 70% of people outside Oslo voted no, 70% of people in Oslo voted yes. And such is the way that the population is dispersed around Norway, 70% out of Oslo wins. So now only 18% of Norwegians would even want to be in the EU. They, they joined the EEA for what they thought would be a halfway house. And that's why it's become known as the halfway house. Because Norway, and to a lesser extent Iceland, thought they would graduate to become full EU members. Actually, when they got there, they began to think, for us, what is not to like? We don't have to have any arguments about fishing, and boy, the Icelanders do not have arguments about fishing. Some of us are old enough to remember the Cod Wars, the only form of uh, <coughs> violence that, that the Icelanders have ever been engaged in, actually, when they had a merry race with uh, the British fleet, who were trying to make them return to the uh, pre the limits before they unilaterally decided they were having a 200 mile limit. They just they said, well, they declared it gradually, but finally they declared a 200 mile limit. Iceland, 300,000 people. It's Wormit. <laughs> you know, it's Wormit, Newport, and kind of, you know, Tateport, right? That, the, the, so the country of Iceland <coughs> decided to unilaterally declare a 200 mile limit, and it saw off the British Navy mostly because the Americans regarded Iceland as too strategically important to lose or to annoy. So actually, they'd already told the Brits they weren't going to be supporting them. There were Brits were out there on their own, and the Icelanders literally ran rings around them. So you don't mess with the Icelanders about very much, actually, but certainly not about fish. Um, now, the, the situation for Denmark is interesting, too. The Danes joined in 1973, and at that very point, the pharaohs that I mentioned earlier, if Iceland is a bit staggering with its tiny 300,000 population, the pharaohs is just, I'm just left speechless. Has anybody been to the pharaohs? Uh, there's a couple of direct flights this year. I think uh, Flyby and somebody else is going there, so it's actually you can get there. It really is quite extraordinary. There's 40,000 of them. Right, what are we now talking about? The bus stop of Tateport. <laughs> um, and they, in 1973, they had such a powerful devolved government that they simply chose not to join. They were that powerful. And the reason they had that is because in 1946, they had an, a, ref, an, a referendum on independence and bear in mind at that point there was probably 30,000 of them voting for independence. And they voted 50.7% they voted yes. Now at that point the, the Danes did what the Brits could have done, but of course would never do because otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here tonight, accommodated them um, and thought quite cleverly the thing to do here is to give them a really powerful parliament. Not pretendy powerful one, but measurably powerful. So in 1946, the Faroese got the powers over practically everything. Um, they they can sign international treaties. We can't. Um, they have a university, 40,000 people. They have their own university that teaches in Faroese, not in Danish, because it's different. Um, and they have just while we're at it, because we're coming up to local elections. 40,000 people have 30 councils. <laughs> In Scotland, 5 million people have 32 councils. So it's a radically different outlook. These people have really got a grip of the ground because they run everything, you know, really, really locally. 
So anyway, so the Faroes who had had that powerful parliament since 1946 took a look at the EU in 1973 that motherland Denmark was joining, saw that common fisheries policy and just went, no. Nah. And at that point just decided not to join. And they were able to not join. It was, there was no argument. Um, they have continued and have done deals themselves. Um, their biggest deal is selling fish to Russia. Their second biggest deal is selling fish to England via Denmark, which they cutely use as a landing pad for the EU to sell stuff to England when they feel like it. So that's how they operate. Um, and Greenland, which is another territory of Denmark, uh, but was less powerful, when it got the same powers uh, as, as the Faroes did in 1985, it also opted straight out of the, out the EU um, because it too didn't want to be part of that fishing policy. And that's why you'll have heard people describe things like a reverse Greenland for Scotland. Because in the way that Greenland, which was uh, a member, came out, the argument would be that Scotland could try to have a differentiated deal. Um, as you can see, it's not quite the same because Scotland has, you know, it's not, we're not going in a reverse direction. This time, the Scots are just trying to remain. We're just trying to stay as EU members. But it's maybe worth thinking about, in a way, what our future might be here because we're either, well, we are, Scotland is certainly a North Atlantic state. It's maybe a wee while for the penny dropping, and actually, it's terribly ironic. Sitting in a, a town, a city like Dundee, um, people should have, of all people should understand that Scotland is a North Atlantic state. Dundee, with its whaling, preceded the Norwegians in a lot of the seas off Greenland. Um, there's been huge, ex obviously huge um, expeditions from Dundee to the north out of here. But for some reason, we think Scotland is the central belt. This is problematic, to put it mildly. This would be like Oslo thinking that it's sort of somewhere in the middle of Germany because Oslo is actually closer to Germany than it is to the north of its own country. But it doesn't think like that because it's taken great strides to not think like that. You have to kind of make an effort to think where you are geopolitically and where we are is we are a North Atlantic state. That is not a bad thing either. You might have noticed that the North Atlantic states are kind of generally speaking doing okay. There are many things that argue that in terms of resource acquisition, in terms of fisheries, in terms of uh, shipping passage, that much is moving north in the world. And there's nothing to be particularly worried about being a North Atlantic state. Um, in fact, there's probably a lot to be gained by Scotland having someone come and administer a pretty sm smart tango across our faces and reminding us that we too could have a really prosperous fishing industry if we had control of it. Uh, that the Norwegians managed to have both higher conservation levels than Scotland and more people employed in fishing and more net gain from fishing than us. And much of that seems to be because of Spanish ingress. I mean, we know this is the fishermen have been complaining about this for a long time. But the point is, if we want to keep the fishing stocks up, never mind just the trade, and that's important too, we could be running our fisheries dramatically differently. Uh, when it comes to common agricultural policy, um, you, you might notice that there are some things that are very unequally distributed in Scotland, and one of them is land, particularly farmland. Now, you can't necessarily blame the common agricultural policy for this, but you can certainly point out that when there are huge inequities in a system, the common agricultural policy just tops it up quite nicely in many respects. So we have a system where there are slipper farmers. This is where quotas are involved, quotas can be traded, and you don't actually need to be act actively farming to get the money in from the subsidies. In fact, you don't even need to be living in Scotland. Uh, there are slipper farmers who own very large bits of land, or who sometimes are renting bits of it and owning bits of it, but whatever, the key point is they have quota, and they're living in the south of Spain, getting common agricultural policy subsidies. The same is true with the common fisheries policy. There is, there are, it's a, it's a bizarre um, idea, slipper fishermen. 
who are doing the same thing. They're off on the side of spend a lot of them. Now, come on, wake up, folks. You know, we, we, are, we are so distanced from the land, and in many fishing communities, there are no Scots fishing anymore. There are a couple of owners, and the rest of the boats are staffed by people from Eastern Europe or Filipinos who sleep on the boats and are paid something like, you know, three quid a day. Get home once a year. That's the Scotch fishing industry. Is that what we want? <coughs> well, I mean, if you wanted to rattle the cage, if you wanted to reorder some things, you might begin to look at the way that these European policies have fixed the patterns of unequal distribution in Scotland, and you might begin to think that you might usefully do with a bit of a kind of cold turkey period where you get a hold of those powers again and you decide what activities you want to subsidise. You decide, in Scotland, we decide what size and type of farmer we want to encourage. We decide these things because at the moment we're not. And so there, there's kind of those arguments for being a bit like the North Atlantic states saying, do you know the EU? Nah. Let's just go to the EA. Okay, we've got to pay money to get into the single market, but whatever, at least we have access to it. We don't have all the problematic bits. We still have freedom of movement. We still have a good turnover of people from Europe. Sounds fine. You know, that sounds great. And actually, the Nordics, just to say, however, the Nordics had this outlook about, about the benefits of freedom um, much earlier than the European Union. And the Nordic travel area was set up 40 years before Schengen. So in fact, a lot of the Nordic countries that are not in the EU have opted into Schengen simply to make it easier for other Nordic neighbours to travel because they think it's so important to be able to move effortlessly between their countries. But then just let's just take a look at the other option, which is full EU membership. Um, the other, so the other option to this is, is the full Buna, is European Union membership. And obviously the Finns are very in there, but actually at the same time so are the Swedes and the Danes. And the Danes have been quite sort of Eurosceptic members. They've had more referendums on bits of European policy than anybody else in the EU. And the Swedes were quite reluctant joiners. They joined later than other people mostly because they have such an extraordinary welfare state that they imagine that any new regulations put through by the EU would only bring their standards down. Now it just speaks volumes about um, how we've all lived our lives over the last century that the EU could be perceived as being something that would bring standards down. Because of course in Scotland we all think that it brings standards up. It's the only reason that there was ever any limit to the working day. The Working Time Directive was something that brought an awful lot of common sense, as we would say in Scotland, into a Thatcherite world at the time. But the Swedes were very worried about how the EU would basically erode their standards. Um, so they were reluctant to come in, but they began to think eventually that there was no point having a squeaky clean kind of Sweden with the people's home and great state provision if you weren't pushing the boat out for socialism a bit further afield. And just by the by, their economy was stagnating too. So here we have another possibility, which is a cluster of little northern states, all of whom could make a decision to change the European Union. And Sweden in particular is in an interesting place at the moment, because it has a new government um, whose deputy prime minister you might have seen uh, on social media uh, Isabella Lovin. You might have seen her in a picture where she was signing an executive order flanked by a whole bunch of women, basically taking the piss out of Donald Trump. <laughs> but actually, which executive order was quite interesting because it was one redoubling Sweden's commitment to climate change. And what she said was quite interesting because she said, we can now forget, if we ever took it seriously, the idea of a progressive American lead in the world. For the next four to five years, it's gone. If there's going to be any sort of thought leadership in the world, where is it going to come from? And at the risk of sounding a bit up ourselves, as Europeans can often do, you know, knocking out the whole world apart from ourselves, well, there's the European Union. And so the Swedes have decided that for the benefit of the world, for the benefit of saving the climate, for the benefits of trying to extend ideas of social protection, they are redoubling their efforts to change the European Union. 
the Swedes, the Danes, the Finns. There's a little band of countries, they all have populations of 5 billion, they all have extremely good welfare provision, they all have a like-minded attitude and a, and a success rate, um, and then there's Scotland. <laughs> now, you know, when I looked at this again and again, I wouldn't be sure myself from the amount I know at the moment, which isn't very much, but it's perhaps a bit more than others who haven't thought, thought this way yet, I don't know what should be the best option, but you know actually, it's a great thing to have those options in front of you and to see that there are viable models for whatever you decide your national interest to be. And the thing is, at this event, when there was people from every different, you know, one of these countries there, there was nobody from Finland trying to say to the folk of the Faroes, you guys should come into the European Union now, you know, you spent enough time out in the cold, or, or vice versa. People could see that the Finns were in a particular position. They could understand, the most anti-European Union people could understand the Finns' desire to have that as a common security policy. And equally, the Finns can entirely understand why the Icelanders with their boisterous 200 mile limit, or the Faroese you know, with 90% of their uh, income coming from fish, wouldn't look twice at the European Union as it's currently constituted. The question that we haven't gone through in Scotland is what is in our interests? How are our interests best served? What proportion of our, of our national income or the vitality of our country or keeping people in coastal communities, what proportion of that is served by fishing? Is there a chance that we could actually argue, negotiate better than the UK for fishing for Scotland if we were independent? Kind of you betcha. But still, so could Norway, and they decided not to go in and take the chance. They just stayed clear of the entire policy. It is the EU right for change? I mean, its, it's leadership is saying that it, it suspects that it will change. Some of them say they don't think it will even survive. Now, those people who are members of the EEA and EFTA say that it will probably be more stable than the EU in the next file, and that might be another argument for getting stuck accidentally in a permanent halfway house. But the thing is, if we don't start to think like this, you know, think actively about which way our interests might best be served, we're not beginning to, to think like people who live in the early days of a better nation. We're not thinking over that minor problem of independence to the bigger issue of what contribution we make in the world and where we place ourselves. And in the way that any decent uh, mover gets a little bit warmed up before they start, um, we should be thinking at the moment beyond these, these uh, the, the first set of issues that confront us about independence, because actually, when you start to describe the types of decision and power that you might have, and the parallels that you might then rightfully be able to draw between ourselves and some of our Nordic neighbors, it gets interesting. You know, it gets, it gets exciting, potentially. And actually, we're going to need that. Because otherwise, people reckon they've done this one already. They've already been through an independence referendum. We're already getting the press are coming out with these same old, you know, stuff, currency. And that's all we'll get, a technical debate, a dis set of displacements from the real deal down to little dressage event you know, like in a plat sort of place you lose 10 points type stuff. We're not in a blinking dressage event. We're in life. And it's got courses and pulses and it's bigger than all of this. But if we're not going out demonstrating how that's true, why should we expect the public to get excited? So it's strange. Here we are tonight on a Thursday night when it's a bit Baltic apart from certain talented people in front of me. Um, <laughs> And we're all sitting here gathered to talk about Europe for it, you know? I mean, something has changed already, but I think the thing to do is to try to further occupy that space with the interest it really has. And it does, because the final thing to say is that attitudes, just, of course, just as we're beginning to think, do you know something? Maybe there's another destination, maybe there's another European club worth considering apart from the EU. Just as we're beginning to think like that, the EU is beginning to get a bit come hither. <laughs> um, you know they were a bit sniffy the first time round, but actually now they've worked it out. They're going to lose England, just they just are. 
So actually, what do you want to do? Just lose everybody or just kind of like, you know, Quibi Prize, Scotland, uh, five million people, where the, the, you know, where the most, in the same way as the only person that can prove their sanity is someone recently released from an asylum. Um, the Scots are the only ones who can prove they're keen on Europe. You know, we, we've joined. We will be the most recent ones to actively, in the middle of all this stuff, after griefs, after disappointments, and all that stuff, we in cold, you know, sanity, choose to join this blinking thing. That's pretty impressive. And there's, you know, there's there's resources here, massive energy resources. You wouldn't want to lose us, um, not to mention the whiskey. So <laughs> there's reasons that Europe is just warming up a little bit, um, and. Uh, the Jacqueline Miner, who is the EU representative in Britain, she was the one who last time round said that Scotland would be in the queue with uh, Montenegro, Serbia and everybody else. She's now realised, which of course she always could have done, um, that because Scotland has been a member of the EU, it already has embodied in it EU law. It already observes the four Aki, the freedoms. In fact, we're already European up here. And that means we skip right to the front of the queue, Begora. Well, it's funny because we were still European the last time around 2014, but hey, bygones, you know. So um, there's been more. You could list the number of people who have done pretty well about turns. Guy Verhofstadt, who's the chief negotiator, the Brexit negotiator on behalf of the EU, sent a sort of love message to Scotland on Valentine's Day, which is really sweet, and the whole text is in there, I can't remember it. But basically, he's paying great tribute to the, the Scots internationalist outlook, to our inventive past, and to the possibilities of putting that all together within Europe. You know, people will soon be falling over themselves to try and get the Scots to walk their way. We're not nothing. We're a catch. <laughs> So, you know, things have changed and we need to kind of get our heads together on that and get a bit excited about the possibilities. So, that's all I've got to say. <laughs>